I, um, I don't do this very often, and, and I'm sorry if you're going to feel like this is kind of a, a Catholic thing, because um, we're up and down, up and down, but I want to ask you to stand up as I read God's Word to you today. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. The justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways. When they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked. For he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and the needy to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken. But the Lord upholds the righteous. The days of the blameless are known to the Lord and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty, but the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. If the Lord delights in any in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young and now I am old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever. But the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of God is in his heart. His feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. But the Lord will not leave them in their power or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off. You'll see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace, but all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. And blessed be the reading of the word of God. May, you may be seated.
Those were some of the very last words of our King David. Psalm 37. And we have been studying his life now for a long time. 32 different messages out of his life. In fact, in our last time together, we saw him die. And usually I end a series when a fellow dies. But there are some things about David that I, I want to cover that we really did not examine in our study of his life. A couple of things that I want to say one more time and a couple of things that I haven't said yet. We really aren't going to be here long today. I'm going to try to keep this brief. And of course, I know what you're thinking. Oh, I've heard him say that before. You know, we preachers are always taking knocks about how long we preach. Heard about a church and they hired this preacher just sight unseen. They'd heard some real good things about him. And he showed up on the first Sunday and he preached for five minutes and then he sat down. Well, the deacons loved that. But everybody else was a little bit kind of questioning. Well, the next Sunday he preached for 30 minutes and everybody kind of thought, you know, that, that's, that's right. That'll be just fine. Well, the third Sunday he preached for an hour and a half. And it didn't take long and the elders demanded to have a meeting with him and, and they asked him, well, what is going on with your sermon length? We can't get a, a feel for what to expect from you. And he apologized. He said, you know, I, I feel really bad about this. I, I, just let me explain. You see, I didn't want to tell you when you hired me that I have false teeth. I was afraid that you might not hire me because you might think I'm, I'm a little too old, but I do have false teeth. And that first Sunday... They were hurting so bad, I could only talk for five minutes. But the second Sunday, they didn't hurt at all. And so I preached for 30 minutes, which is actually normally what I, what I preach. But that third Sunday, I was running late at the house and I, I'd made a mistake. And in my mistake, I picked up my wife's teeth by accident and I put those in. I won't be preaching for a, an hour and a half, but... But I want to just take a few minutes and, um, and just kind of summarize some things about David's life that I want you and, and I to remember today. You know, if, if you read Psalm 37 and you just didn't know anything about its author, anything about the background of him, you'd think that this guy, he's so spiritual, he didn't even know how to spell sin. But then you read about David's life. And you come to realize that the guy who wrote those words spent more than his share of time listening to the wrong voices. David had his share of low moments. And so you ask yourself, why then is he remembered so favorably in Scripture? I think we need to go back to the very first things that we ever learned about David in this study. And they're not from David. They're not even from the prophet Samuel. They're from God himself. This is this this first thing is when Samuel was sent to Saul. Saul had betrayed God. He had disobeyed God. And Samuel said to him in first Samuel 13, verse 13, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Those are the first words we ever hear spoken about David. The second thing we ever hear about David is actually a few chapters later in 1 Samuel 16. We still haven't even met the man yet, but in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel is sent to the village of Bethlehem to anoint a new king. And Jesse's bringing out all of his sons, these strapping young men. And Samuel keeps thinking, now surely one of these guys has got to be king. And God keeps saying no. And finally God says to him in verse 7, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the very first thing that we learn before we even meet David for all of his faults is there was something about his heart that God liked. Now those words were never repeated again, but the truth remained. So how did David live? Well, briefly, first, he lived with a mission. You could, you could basically sum up this entire review of his life in light of his three goals. In, in early in his life, his goal was to become the king of Israel. His next goal in life was to rid Israel of all of her enemies. 
And his third goal, much later in life, was to build a temple for Yahweh. Now, he didn't reach all three of those goals. He reached the first two of those goals, but God never let him reach that last goal. But all of his life, he was living his life with a mission. And that's something that I believe you and I need to embrace for ourselves. We need to learn that from David. It isn't important that we reach every goal, but it is important that we live our life with goals. David, as we saw last time, he didn't die looking back on all the things he had done. He died looking ahead. He was preparing the way so that the people that came after him could accomplish that last goal that he had. And I think that's important. I think it's important to ask God to give you goals in your life that will help you just keep on living life. Do you know people? I know people that just live their life aimlessly. Just wander through life. And we have to have goals. You know, some people die before they're even dead. David did not. He lived his life with a mission. And the second thing that you could say is that he lived with a passion. David, as we have seen, is not a stained glass figure. He is depicted in Scripture in all of his moods. And he had many of them. He was a passionate man. He wasn't like a lot of church folk today. We're a bit more calm. We're a bit more placid. David was the kind of man, though, where he could be very high or he could be very, very low. But whatever emotion he felt that day, he wasn't going to try to cover it up. He's going to let you know how he felt. And one thing about emotional people like that, I think their emotional nature is partly responsible for the creative genius that they actually often show. To express his emotions was also one of the reasons that he could write the things that he wrote. We haven't said a lot on Sunday mornings about David, the author, but we need to today. Because when you think about it, his pen pricked many more hearts than his sword ever did. David built a kingdom for his people, but he wrote for every person. It would be impossible to estimate literally the multiple millions upon millions of people that even to this very day are blessed by the life of David because David had this capacity to take what he was feeling and put it on paper and we read it today and we're like I I I'm, I feel that I know that in fact I think David is one of the most relatable characters in scripture and I think so many of us are fond of him because when we read his life we read through his psalms and we can say you know I feel just the way he feels I mean, I don't know what experience you have had, but it's incredible when you look through David's life, it's almost impossible to think of an experience that David did not go through. Let's just look at some of them. Do you know what it's like to have brothers or sisters who are jealous of you or spiteful of you? David did. Do you know what it's like to have parents who don't think you're old enough to do anything? David did. Do you know what it's like to have your own people think, you know what, you're too small? David did. You know what it's like to have your boss or your commander who formerly was your best supporter turn on you? David did. Do you know what it's like to have a former friend literally try to take your life? David did. You know what it's like to live on the run? Not just one day, not even just a month. But for several years, David did. Do you know what it's like to have a spouse stop loving you? David did. Do you know what it's like to see one of your children raped? David did. Do you know what it's like to have a little baby die in your home? David did. Do you know what it's like to have an older child die? David did. Do you know what it's like to have your own child betray you? David did. Do you know what it's like to really want to do something for God, but God to tell you, no, you're, you're not going to do this. David did. 
You know what it's like to have a most trusted friend stab you in the back and betray you in the worst way? David did. Can you relate to any of those experiences? And David had the genius to take what those kind of experiences would do to your heart and then put them on paper and relate them to God. He shared not just his emotional struggle, but his spiritual struggles. And I'm probably underestimating this, that over 99% of most Christians have been blessed more than once by the words of King David. He lived his life with a passion. And third, he lived with a vision. Maybe you didn't know that much about David. But David lived his life not thinking about his own kingdom so much. But about another kingdom. Jesus' kingdom. In fact, when the apostles established the early church, when they presented the legitimacy of Christ's claim to be God and to sit on the throne of David, they would quote David. In Acts chapter 2, the very first gospel sermon that's ever preached, who was it that, that clinched Peter's argument? It was Peter quoting David. When he prophesied, here's the sermon, Acts 2, beginning in verse 22. He said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. Peter continues, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. You know, when I think of all of the the words that we would use to describe David, most of us would not choose the word prophet. But David is one of the greatest prophets in Scripture. It was David who prophesied that the son of David wouldn't stay in the grave. That his body would not see decay. In Acts chapter 4, when when Peter and John are are released from being in prison, it says in verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. That last word, anointed one, is literally the word Messiah or Christ. That the one thing that gave comfort to those early Christians in the early church was that they saw that David had prophesied that there would be a people one day that stood against the Christ. And they got to realize, it's us. We're it. Go to Acts 13. This time, it's not Peter, it's Paul. And he's speaking to the people in the city of Antioch. Verse 32, it says... 
We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. The fact that God raised Him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere. You will not let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. You see, the favorite person to quote from the early church to prove that Jesus was the legitimate heir to the throne of David was David, David, the prophet. That's why I think we kind of got wrapped up in his life. And it's good to study his life like we have studied very, I believe, in depth. But you can lose the spiritual side of the man. But David's hope was never in his own kingdom. But it was always in another's kingdom, the kingdom of the one that God would never allow the grave to hold on to. And if you want to read the clearest description in Scripture of the crucifixion, then read Psalm 22. Almost every line of that psalm describes what Jesus would endure on the cross. David lived his life with a a vision. So let's close with three lessons that I want us to learn from the life of David. And to be honest... (laughs) We spent the majority of this year learning lessons from the life of David. And it's really kind of hard to kind of narrow this down to just three. But but these are the three that really stuck with me more than any other. And here's the first. Allow sin no place in your life. That's one thing I've learned from David. Now, we have seen where sin could enter into David's heart. But we've also seen that it didn't stay there very long. One thing I see from David that stood out, David knew how to repent. He never let his heart get calloused to sin. Yes, he would sin, but he would never let sin just live in his heart so long that he became comfortable with it. After his affair with Bathsheba and all that that entailed, he wrote a psalm in which he spoke these words. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, will you not despise. David teaches us that turning from evil and and returning to the Lord with a true contrite spirit, God always welcomes that. And I don't know about you, but that gives is this sinner a lot of hope. Don't allow sin to stay with you so long that you lose your sensitivity to the things of God. Another lesson that I believe we can learn is to beseech in each case of your life. It does not matter what the circumstance may be. Interpret your life through the lens of the purposes and focuses of God. That's what David would do. He would stop and he'd think about God again. And he would try to put his life experiences in focus with God. And that would somehow always get him back on track. That's how he would handle delays. Because it's not easy when God says you're going to be king and then he makes you wait 10 years before you ever become king. That's how he handled his attacks. That's how he handled God's discipline. And God gave him discipline many times. But no matter what was happening in his life, no matter what the circumstance was, he would focus again back on God. He would talk to God about it. He would discern God's will. And he would try to live his life through that. You see, I I, I think sometimes we live... A long time without regularly getting in touch with God. We forget about his purposes. Set your sights on Jesus. And don't wander off track. David never lost sight of God. 
Look at verse 4 from that psalm that we read at the beginning. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. What you do when life gets hard is you take that to God and then you wait patiently for him to help you in that. And that doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy to you or I. But that's what we learn from David. That's the way to handle life's delays and setbacks and adversities. One final lesson. Count on his grace all your life. From that psalm we read at the beginning, verse 24. Though he stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, if a guy knew about stumbling, (laughs) David did. But David said, if you commit your way to God, even if you stumble, God's not going to let you fall because he's got you in his hand. Now, if I asked what was your favorite psalm, I think a bunch of you would probably say Psalm 23. And that's good. It's a great psalm. But I would maybe... Put forward for your consideration Psalm 103. I want to just read a little bit of this to you. These words that I'm going to read could not be written from your life unless you have had a very obvious and demonstrable experience with the grace of God. Listen to these words. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, So far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. If I asked you to take a word and sum up everything in your life that you've accomplished, I don't think the word would be the one that David chose. Dust. You see, when it's all said and done, we came from dust and we return to dust. And it's a comfort to know that God remembers that. God is gracious. He is compassionate and he remembers how we were formed. He remembers what we are. And and if you put your trust in God, he will be gracious and he will remove your sin from you. As far as the east is from the west. And just take a moment and try to figure out how far that actually is. You see, I think more than anybody in our Bibles, David knew God's grace. A God that was ready to forgive the heart that was contrite and humble. And if I learn anything else from David, I want to learn to keep my heart right with my God. David says in that psalm, trust in the Lord and do good. And we would do well to let those words be written etched, just stamped deeply into our own hearts. Stand up, I want to pray over you. Father, we thank you so much for your servant, David. We thank you that you have left so much of his life and his poetry for us to read. Father, I would beg you this morning 
not to let the conclusion of this study of his life to be just another series to sit on our website, but to cause us all right now to remember that what you look at more than anything else is our heart. And if our heart is hard and insensitive to sin, it doesn't really matter what we do. If our heart stays soft, then no matter what we've done, we will find forgiveness when we seek it out from you. So help us to leave today having done some serious heart evaluations this morning. We pray this in the name of King Jesus, the Son of David.